speaker today who has a background in marine biology, estuarine community ecology and food webs, benthic invertebrate biology and taxonomy. And in addition to this, she is also a class four commercial scientific diver. She's well-versed in a variety of scientific disciplines and methods and has collaborated both locally and internationally with researchers and spent time as a research assistant for the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center in the United States of America. She also found the time to co-author seven peer-reviewed articles in well-recognized scientific journals, as well as review for the quarterly review of biology. Thankfully, she has found the time to give us a presentation today. So to give you a more in-depth view of her exciting journey and background, I am honored to welcome Dr. Jessica Dawson. Thanks so much, Aisha. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, always great to give a talk. Um, I was saying to Aisha earlier that I've never been scarm or shy, as they say, about talking. But I find that when giving a talk about something you love and something you enjoy, it helps you often learn more about what you're doing. So it's the same about prepping a talk like this, is thinking about what is interesting about what we do and what are the important factors about it. So it's always a pleasure to be able to give a talk. So I really appreciate the opportunity to do so. Um, so yeah, just to give you a bit of a, a look at what we're going to be doing today, um, I've divvied up the talk into three different sections. Um, the start, you can sit back and relax, and it's mostly going to be, you know, my story and introduction to what I studied, um, what work I did, and how I got to where I am today, and what it is I do at this point, just to give, especially the students, some kind of idea of how it is that you can get to this point and the different steps that are involved and, and how you sort of, you know, just got to keep swimming. Um, there's a lot involved to get there, but it really is great once you get through it. Um, then I'm going to move into an introduction on estuaries. So we're focusing on estuaries today, a bit of background, a bit of definitions, um, a look at how we do estuary health assessments. Um, then we're going to have a little like workshop and I'm going to include a, a group of you and see how well we can sort of do our own estuary health assessment for an estuary quickly, just at a low level and see what goes into doing one of those and get some experience in that. And then move on to a bit of what it takes to manage estuaries. So what we need to be able to do estuary management. So, I mean, it's really always important. And the reason that we get into a lot of these things is because of something that happened when we were young. So, um, you know, a love of the environment, a love of doing things um, often leads to what makes you decide to do what you're doing. Um, so for me, I was always much happier outside. And an important thing for me is maintaining that and keeping that. So fishing as a small kid, still fishing. The gear has just changed. You know, having a strong affinity for mud. Um, this one is still true as well. The only difference here is that I now have to do the laundry. Uh, it's no longer my mother that does the laundry when I get myself this muddy. Um, similar sort of an affinity to all sorts of critters and small creatures. Um, nowadays, they just have grown and got slightly bigger. Um, but all of these things are things that I have experienced through doing my studies and through doing the coursework that I did and now into the work that I'm doing. So a little bit more detail from me in terms of what I studied. All of my studies were at the University of Cape Town. However, I had a lot of affiliation with Rhodes University, the University of Kwazulu-Natal, and Nelson Mandela University. So I worked with these groups as well as some groups outside of the country um, relating to all my work, uh, although I was registered the entire time at the University of Cape Town. So back in 2008, I graduated with my BSc and that was in marine biology and oceanography. Um, then I went on to do a master's and straight after that, in, I mean, an honors and straight after that into the master's. The honors is sort of a broad spectrum um, honors in zoology with two focus projects. And then the master's was zoology with a greater focus on estuarine communities and the same with the PhD. So when you look at my actual degree, it says zoology, but my focus was estuarine ecology and estuarine habitats. Um, so, I mean, a lot of the things that when people look at this and they look at it's a long time to study. And people always say, you know, what was the hardest part? You know, what was the most difficult thing that you did? 
And I can tell you unequivocally, it was definitely undergrad. Um, in undergrad, it's not focused. I mean, they put you in physics and chemistry and mathematics and all sorts of crazy classes that are not specific. I mean, I thought I was going to be studying, you know, marine biology, and these were my first and second year subjects. And it made it very difficult because it's not as interesting as when you start to do the other things. So even when we started to do the biology, there was a focus on a lot of different things. I mean, we had the photosynthesis, the human cell biology, we did parasites, and then we did the mathematics that makes the waves move. So there is a lot of hard stuff that's done and it's not very focused in undergrad. So that's the biggest thing that I always tell anybody who asks, you know, how do I study for marine biology or what gets you into it and what's the interesting part is just hang in there. You know, in the beginning, it's very definitely difficult but it gets better the longer you go so just for an example um, in my honors i did two honors projects the first one being looking at grazers these so you can see on the top there the small little starfish that move around on the the surface of soft sediments in uh, estuaries and lagoons my specific study site was Longabon Lagoon, which is up on the west coast of South Africa. And a really great place, get out there, put in cages, put in the, the starfish in different quantities, and then try and see how they affected the microalgal community. So there's very pretty green thingies on the bottom there. Um, and see how they change depending on the different densities of starfish that were there. My second project was where the taxonomy came in. Um, this is looking at the different species of organisms that are around. Somebody else's project looked at a small crab that is found in the estuaries of South Africa. And originally it was thought that this was one crab all around the coastline. And then one or two years before me, one of the honor students did the genetics and discovered that actually there are five different species of crab. So my project was now that they're confirmed as different species, I needed to put them under a microscope and take a look and determine what morphologically, so what in their physical structure made them differ from each other. So that somebody who wants to ideate in the field or in the lab doesn't have to do the expensive genetics work. Um, and part of that was drawing the crabs. Now, I am no artist at all. <laughs> Thankfully, there is this amazing technology that puts a extra mirror on a microscope and you put your organism under the microscope, put your hand under the mirror and the two translate into each other and they overlap. So your bifocal vision makes them overlap. And it's basically the equivalent of tracing your organisms. So that's how those drawings came to be. But that was one of the two honors projects that I did. And that was just something that taught you in taxonomy. There's a lot of very, fine detailed work and when someone says to me how the how you tell the difference between amphipod a and amphipod b is looking at the fifth joint of the third leg of it, a lot of people end there and say go jump not their not their cup of tea but it's a very valuable part of what we do and it's got some precision based skill to it which makes it kind of enjoyable too so onto my master's. My master's was a continuation of my, my first uh, honors project. Uh, again, go back into the Longbarn Lagoon, looking at the starfish, more cages, more starfish, um, comparisons where we took the starfish out completely. So one of the interesting things about these species is unlike you and I, where we put our food in our mouth and goes down into your stomach, the starfish basically extrudes its mouth out, its stomach out of its mouth and puts its stomach on the ground and absorbs its food directly into its stomach. And in doing so, it leaves like a mucus layer behind. So similar to like a slug, where after you see it walking on land, it leaves that slimy goo. The same applies for a starfish. It's just not as visible. So we also did experiments into looking at how if we artificially added the chemicals that come from the stomach, was the effect of the starfish due to their consuming the organisms or due to their stabilizing effects that the chemical contributions that they make differ. So another very interesting project that had some very fun times in the field and out and about. Then I moved on to a slightly larger grazer, um, a, 
a different estuary as well. So I moved up the East Coast and moved to St. Lucia Estuary, which is one of the biggest estuarine systems we have in the country. Very cool estuarine system, very unique. Um, and one of the few remaining estuaries that are home to hippopotamus. Um, the hippos are really interesting grazers because they don't extrude, extrude their stomachs, but they do feed on land and then move back into the water. So with that, they're bringing nutrient sources from land into the water because like many grazers, they don't digest their food completely. So anything that they poop out is kind of gold for certain ecosystems. So in some places where the water is clear enough, there are examples where you can actually see fish that sit and wait behind a hippopotamus because they're waiting for that food source. So we wanted to look at what the effect of all the hippos in the St. Lucia estuary were. So this meant doing a lot of field work, getting out into the St. Lucia system. Um, and because I was looking at um, the full food web, I was collecting everything from mud samples to get the critters in the mud, through water column drags to get zooplankton, fish, and then up to the crocodiles, which is where the crocodiles came in, you know, collecting the crocodiles and collecting samples from cro crocodiles and analyzing those in the field. I was also collecting hippo poop. So many people say you're working with the most dangerous animal in the world. Um, really, is that what, what happened? You know, you caught crocodiles. Were you ever in any trouble? And the most dangerous thing that chased me was a dung beetle because I'd spent the day collecting hippo dung and obviously still had that odor. So I went for a walk on the beach and got followed by a dung beetle. So with the right kind of um, <laughs> risk management, there's not a lot that you can't do in this country. Getting all the data means a lot of lab work. So some of that chemistry that I was so not fond of in undergrad did in fact come in useful. Some of the lessons learned in chemistry. So I spent a lot of time analyzing some samples up at Rhodes University. Um, all of this and all the data and all of it put together helps in the end to produce a product, to find out and find answers to what happens when you have a whole lot of hippopotamus in a system and how they affect the ecosystem. So one of the interesting things that we wanted to understand was that in the estuary, just before I started my thesis, the water level dropped so significantly that it was down to about 10% of its normal volume. So if you now think that you've got all of these hippopotamus that are now being reduced into a much smaller water area, it's a lot of hippo poop. And um, basically what we found was, I mean, originally, like, you know, I mean, I don't know if any of you live on farms or anything like that, when horse manure is like gold, I mean, my mom gets it from the local farm, puts it through a shredder and it's compost, it's fantastic. But when it's in such large quantities, the hippo dung starts to actually have negative effects on the benthic community. So one of the things it does, so if you have a look at the picture on the left, is you start to get this mat of dung that occurs on the bottom of the system. And that starts to prevent the penetration of light. So you don't get as much photosynthesis in the photosynthetic organisms living on the sediment. You also get chemical cues that change the way that communities that normally come and settle so larvae in the water column that normally settle on the benthos no longer have the right chemical cues because there's this barrier between the sediment and the, and the larvae. So you have a reduction in the settlement of organisms. You also have a physical barrier. So things that usually are just on the surface or burrow, have trouble burrowing. Um, and all of these things were things that we discovered through um, the research that I was doing in my PhD. And as Aisha mentioned in the introduction, the, the famous saying is publish or perish in terms of research. Um, but it's also always fascinating and always great that if you've done something new and you've done research, you want others to be able to learn from it. So I've done quite a bit of publications in relation to the work that I've done, um, the, one of which is still in process for my, my PhD. So the final paper for my PhD, which was um, five years ago, is still in the in the works, but hopefully to be done soon. Um, and all of this then contributes to the literature going forward. 
So once I finished studying, I started working, um, or actually just before I finished studying, before I finished my PhD, I got the opportunity to join Anke Environmental Consultants as a junior consultant and to start working for them. And I've been there ever since. So towards the end of 2018, I started. Um, I was a junior consultant at the time, and since then have moved up and am now a senior consultant um, within the, the company. Um, it, it's a, a very nice company with very broad reaching um, interests and variations. We say that our director wears many hats and likes to be involved as much as possible, which keeps it very interesting because it's a constant learning curve. Um, there are probably about 30 of us at the moment um, with some people permanently in the lab. So the lab starts probably about 10 staff and then the rest are all um, consultants. This has given me an opportunity to do a wide large amount of travel. So a lot within South Africa itself. So all the red dots are places I've been for work. Um, also quite regularly going up into Namibia, um, which is what I do leaving on Sunday for a week, going to do some more sampling in Namibia. And then I also had the amazing experience of being part of a large marine plastics pollution project um, in which we traveled um, South Africa, Botswana, Angola, the DRC, and Madagascar. So quite an eye-opening experience, a number of different SADAC countries, and exposure to the different way that the different environmental departments within a country work, which is very fascinating. So generally speaking, ANCA's exposure is pretty high. Um, they do research in a number of different countries, and while I haven't been to them all yet, I have had the opportunity to help work on different projects um, or analyze different samples from Guinea, Congo, Sierra Leone, Madagascar, I mean, Mozambique, and then Papua New Guinea, which um, is not in fact on the map because it's new, but also because at the time I didn't know where it was and had to add it. So if anyone else like me is unsure about where Papua New Guinea is, we got a whole lot of benthic samples from Papua New Guinea, which is on the northwestern coast of Australia, made for some very interesting and different taxonomic IDs because they're not organisms that we're used to seeing. So then in terms of what I do as a senior consultant, um, at the moment, I'm the head of the estuarine department. So I lead the estuarine projects and manage most of those. Um, but because I'm a commercial diver as well, I do do a lot of um, the, the diving research and the diving activity. And I'm looking to advance that and busy with my supervisors and skippers course. So we'll add that to the list, which also helps get out in the field. Um, and then as mentioned, I'm also one of the benthic taxonomists, which in this country is a very rare um, eh, quality. So not many, not many people do taxonomy. As I mentioned, not many people can manage the, the, the precision in it and get frustrated with trying to find something so small on a very small organism. Um, so it's quite a dying art, but many of us were lucky enough to be trained by Charlie Griffiths at the University of Cape Town, who has, I think, described more than a hundred new species to science and was very big into taxonomy. And because of that, my range isn't restricted to estuaries. So I'm also part of a lot of the marine research. I've done some terrestrial research and I also delve into policy and management. Um, so in terms of the division of what my work looks like, so in a year, generally, I'd say you'd divvy up about 25% of my time in field work, about 15% in the lab because I'm no longer a permanent taxonomist. Most of the time I do sort of quality checks and checkups for the, the lab staff that are there now. Um, and then 50% reporting and 5% project management, 5% proposals, because it's a requirement that we bring in more work. So you always have to put out proposals and manage plans for new projects. So to give you a brief example of what it looks like and what some of the field work looks like. Oh, a bit fast. So here's an example of field work in Namibia, and this is doing beach sampling on the Namibian coast. We go up into very remote areas, some derelict mine areas and all of that in order to collect samples on the beach to have a look at how the beach community has changed um, both pre, post and during mining and to see how it recovers and what the systems look like as part of the monitoring protocols for mining within the Namibian coastline. 
In terms of dive work, there's a whole lot of stuff we do around the country. Our team was just out this morning collecting some dive samples, um, going out and having a look at invertebrate counts along the coastline. We do fish ID and counts. So you go and spend a minute in the water column and count all the fish around you, size them, ID them, and then we compare them inside, inside marine protected areas to outside marine protected areas to see the efficacy of, of these areas and whether there is a difference. We also do invertebrate surveys, looking at the crayfish populations, the abalone populations, looking at how ranching abalone, so areas where they put abalone into the sea, have those had any effect on the local communities? So you do community assessments. Uh, you look at aquaculture development. So the picture on the far right-hand side is me underneath a mussel raft, uh, where we're doing community assessments of what the communities look like under these aquaculture rafts. And the one on the bottom right, sorry, the bottom left, is looking at an instrument that's been put in the bay in order to monitor the oxygen levels, um, all of which are important to, to make management policies. We also have done some diving in, in the Breda River estuary, so a pretty brown system known to have sharks in it where I couldn't see much further than my own feet. Um, in order to collect samples for the assessment of the impacts of a small desalination plant that was input there during the drought. So a lot of different opportunities out there, a lot of different samples to collect. Uh, one of the most unique experiences that I've had is an offshore experience. Um, although I have quite strong tendencies towards motion sickness, which made the first a couple of days rather... <laughs> interesting. Um, it was an absolutely fascinating experience where we spent more than a month offshore. So that's a month without seeing any land, after which my favorite color changed from blue to green, because I am quite fond of land. <laughs> but um, during this time, we had the amazing um, opportunity to watch basically like the most awesome TV game players ever. So the picture with all the, sc the screens over here is the inside of the ROV pilot's uh, sort of base. So ROV is a remote operated vehicle. And this is a huge thing about the size of the Fortuna that they drop down into the ocean and the pilots sit on board the boat and direct it mechanically from there and send it down to as far as two, 3000 meters below the sea surface so that we could do an assessment of what's there, what's on the bottom of the ocean. Um, um, Anchor's team and Anchor's staff were involved in identifying the critters and putting together species lists for a baseline study um, so that we could determine and quantify what communities are in the different areas of the deep sea around the South African coastline. Some very cool things come about. One of the strangest ones I think I've done is a bat survey. So how do you, put up a device that sounds, um, catches bat sounds about 80 meters in the air when you don't have a large tower or any trees or anything up the West Coast. Um, a combination of our fun friends at the office who are very fond of fishing and some research decided we'd send the device up on a fishing pole in a helium weather balloon. So for one night, we spend the evening with a fishing pole bringing up and down a device to recharge every two hours so that we could monitor bat sounds, um, all for the impact assessment of a wind turbine farm and whether that would affect the bats in the community. So a lot of very interesting field work, all of which leads to quite a lot of lab work. So a lot of preparation goes in, into getting into the field. If you look at the image on the top left, um, a lot of buckets and samples and equipment, uh, a lot of <laughs> different bits and bobs and safety protocols and all sorts of things that go into preparing and that all have to be cleaned and sorted afterwards. And in the field, we collect a whole lot of samples that then come back to our lab and need to be analyzed. Um, these samples also then get picked. So if you've got a whole lot of a sediment sample, you've got to pick everything out that's biological material, put it under microscope, ID it. And one of the new things that we're doing these days is with the increase in technology, we're creating photographic reference collections. So we have this collection of all of photos of all the different things that we find. 
um, both to help us as well as because often the things that we find are not in any of the reference guides that we have. So things that we do up or deep water things or up on the Congo coast where research isn't great, there aren't names for these species. So it's very important that you create a list and a photographic reference of what you're calling, you know, starfish species one. Because if somebody else does research in the same area, then they will look at it, see the morphological features that are involved and call it the same starfish species one until it gets an official name. So quite a lot going in, in the lab, on in the lab. Um, interestingly, it's also a, a lot of diversity, a lot of different things. So as I mentioned, we've done a lot of different sampling. Some is offshore sampling, some in the near shore, some in the intertidal zone. So the depth range of the samples that Anchor has analyzed come from, you know, in the intertidal zero meters, all the way down to 3,600 meters off the west coast of South Africa. Um, and the diversity in these different samples varies greatly. So we have anything from, I think, 19, 20 species in a number of different samples within a bay to upwards of 270, 300 species in some of the samples off the coastline. So a lot of diversity, a lot of differences between different communities and a lot of data. So the next step after data is data processing. So we have to analyze all the data, put it all together, do analytical and statistical work um, and produce results. Some of it is very cool and can be done by a program. So when we have these instruments that go in the water for a long period of time, um, a little bit of programming and spits out this amazing graph that details um, what the instrument is recording. So the image that you can see here is from that Brera River survey where we were looking at how the salinity and temperature changed in the system with the discharge um, from the, the desal plant. And at the top here, you can see the gray at the back is a very distinct uh, indication of how tidal change occurs. So a number of different tides across the year that the instrument was in the water. Temperature also dropping here in winter, the temperature low, the orange, and then increasing again through the summer months. The one in the middle is looking at salinity has a couple interesting points to so the red arrows. That's because we took the instrument out of the water. So it no longer is clocking salinity. Um, but the salinity also varies with the tidal influence with freshwater inflow. So when there's a lot of rain, the salinity can drop in the middle over here, for instance, to completely fresh because it's the fresh water is pushing all the salt water out of the system. And all of this was also then in relation to the amount that's being discharged by the plant. So very interesting work, very easy once you have the program set up and managed to produce. Some of the other stuff is collating all of this data and putting it in stuff that looks pretty for uh, the clients, it takes a lot of um, time to create and manage and helps provide a picture of what it is that we um, are doing, what we're collecting and the data that comes to. And all of this then must go up into a report. So that's where the reporting stage comes in, writing up multiple reports, putting it all together um, for different uses. So a lot of the reports go towards management and monitoring policies, making sure that things that have been already authorized aren't having negative effects. Um, some things go towards policy, and then also a lot of them go to the authorities to assist them in making important environmental decisions. Um, and that's a lot of what is uh, what we do here at Anchor. Um, and then because Anchor has a focus as well on staying with academia, so it's not just the consulting and our director, um, both of which are, I think, research associates at the, the University of Cape Town, want to keep a finger on the pulse in terms of academia. So we also go to conferences and present results in conferences, as well as publish as often as we can. It's less frequent <laughs> um, because of all the work we have, but I do have two papers that I've done with teams from Anchor and have three more in the works um, that still need to be published. So quite an amazing body of work that we do, really exciting to be able to both be sort of 
on the cusp of it, where what you're doing actually contributes directly at the moment and in real life, as well as being able to contribute to research and share what we've learned and what we're doing in the field um, with others and how that affects others. So that's my story 